Good evening, everyone. My name is Kevin Lagore, and I am with Focus Astronomy, and I'd like to welcome you to the Grand Canyon Virtual Star Party 2020. Now, of course, we would all love to be under the beautiful night skies of Grand Canyon National Park, but unfortunately, due to world events, we're not able to be there this year. However, that shouldn't stop us from exploring the wonders of the night sky. And we're going to do that virtually tonight using our telescope, which is actually just outside the control room here. And we're going to be broadcasting images right off the telescope into the digital world for us to explore the universe from anywhere. So without further ado, we're going to get started. And I'm going to shrink myself up here real quick. There we go. And before we get started on the telescope, um, I kind of want to give you an idea of what we're going to be working with tonight because tonight's going to be really fun because we're going to be focusing mostly on some of the popular summer objects that would be, we would be observing at Grand Canyon Star Party and as the Milky Way rises a lot of those gems in the night sky that we see uh, during the summer months. But I want to give you guys an idea of kind of how we're seeing the night sky and it'll give you a better frame of reference for some of the objects we're seeing tonight. So we live in the Milky Way galaxy and of course we can't actually zoom out of the Milky Way so let me shrink myself there we go we can't actually zoom out of our own galaxy it's just it's too big so we can actually observe other galaxies and get an idea of what our galaxy is roughly to look like if we were looking from the outside. And one of the closest galaxies um, to the look of the Milky Way, but also um, it's also very close to us, is the Andromeda Galaxy, M31. Now, this isn't actually visible usually during the star party it rises very late in the evening um, mostly after everyone's gone home it's generally a fall object but for tonight we're actually using it as a reference just to see where we are and how our where we fit in our milky way galaxy uh, so this is the andromeda galaxy now for perspective let's see where we're actually going to be in our galaxy so the yellow spot right here that I have up there on the screen, that kind of represents roughly where our solar system is in comparison to our Milky Way. So we see the core of the galaxy, and of course we're, we're out here in kind of the outer arms. Now, when we're at Grand Canyon, or when we're at a dark sky location, away from city lights we're actually able to see the night sky in its full glory away from all the light pollution and it, this is actually an image from grand canyon star party this is the what the night sky actually looks like from up at the park during the star party and what we're actually seeing here is we're looking along the plane of the galaxy this is called the galactic plane so the core of the galaxy sits right here and then the arms jet out here and down below the horizon into the southern hemisphere. So we're in the summer months when Grand Canyon is generally taking place. We're looking out into that Milky Way. We're looking down the edge there and to make this a little bit easier to kind of digest let me flip this real quick. So now we're looking on edge. Um, imagine looking down the edge of a CD or, you know, the side of a pancake. That's how we're looking at it here. We're seeing our core of the galaxy here, and we're looking along the edge of the galaxy right here. So let me make this a little bit easier. So, for example, here's our Milky Way. We're looking on the edge of that galaxy, right down the edge of the what's called the galactic plane. And... A lot of the stuff that we're going to be seeing tonight is in constellations or areas of the night sky that sit along the galactic plane. We're going to be looking in a lot of the, the regions of the Milky Way. So there's a lot of stars and much of the objects are going to be just dusted 
um, in star fields. So it'll really be quite a beautiful collection of objects tonight. So this was just kind of a precursor to kind of give you a line of perspective on what exactly we're going to be viewing tonight and roughly how we view the night sky, um, particularly this time of year um, in the summer months. So that's kind of our, our starter point. So let's take a second and actually take a look at the night sky right now. We're gonna back out real quick. So this is our night sky. Let's see, see if I can zoom all the way out. There we go. I'm not sure what this stuff is right here. Um, you can just ignore that at the moment. There we go, it's gone. Um, so this is the night sky as we currently see it. You can see the Milky Way rising over here in the east. And we have our collection of stars and constellations. Now, let me uh, turn on our constellation labels here, as well as our lines. And of course, you're never gonna see these lines when you go out to a night sky, but we use them to navigate around the night sky. I like to think of constellations a lot like states and the bright stars inside those constellations are the big cities. And then the cool little off the beaten towns or other little objects that we wanna see, those faint fuzzies, those are the cool places that we wanna visit. So in tonight's episode, we're gonna be taking a look at some of the constellations riding along the line or the, uh, along that galactic plane that we spoke about a couple minutes ago. Um, the major ones that we'll be working in tonight are Scorpio the Scorpion, which is right here, Sagittarius, Ophiuchus. We're doing a little bit of work in Scutum, uh, Cygnus, Lyra, and Volpeca. Um, and we'll probably get to a couple other constellations, but those are the major ones that we're going to be working out in tonight. Um, so some of the folklore, I really enjoy some of the, the folklore. Scorpio the Scorpion right here looks like a big hook. Now, if we were to take ourselves to a different region of the world, let's say the South Pacific, the Hawaiian Islands, and uh, the Polynesian islands all through the South Pacific. Uh, this would not be known as Scorpio. This would be known as Maui's fish hook. Maui fished all the islands out of the sea and afterwards he put it up into the nighttime sky to be preserved. So this, as you flip through different cultures, you'll actually be able to see that the constellation stories change from culture to culture. And Scorpio is one of the more obvious ones, but this is also known as Maui's fish hook. Now, Sagittarius right next door. This one actually is pretty fun because it resembles a teapot. You can see the spout right here. It's the bottom of the teapot. Here's the handle and the lid. Now, the cool thing when you're actually visiting a dark sky location like Grand Canyon, is that the Milky Way, the core of the Milky Way sits right here. And it actually looks like steam from the teapot actually is coming out of the teapot spout and traveling across the sky. It's rather cool to see. Um, it just happens to work out that way. But that is Sagittarius and of course Scorpio. Uh, the other major constellation we're gonna be working in tonight of course was Cygnus. Cygnus is a swan, and uh, it starts up here with the bright beak star known as Alberio. We're going to be taking a view of that through the telescope. Now we come down the neck, right down here to Sadir, which is the center star of Cygnus the swan, and of course the tail star Deneb. And then you can actually see the wings kind of spread off the swan um, this way, and this is also called the Northern Cross. Just above Cygnus, we have the constellation of Lyra. Lyra is a harp, and it can be best uh, seen by the bright star Vega. And uh, Vega and Deneb, as well as Altair down here, form the Summer Triangle. And the Summer Triangle uh, can be seen right here. 
This is actually made up of, like I said, Vega, Deneb, and Altair. And the Summer Triangle, if you were, if you actually have a chance to go outside um, during the summer months, this is almost straight up for most of us in the Northern Hemisphere. If you put your hand in the middle of that triangle, you can actually stretch your entire hand fully stretched out, full length of your arm, and it will actually fit inside of that triangle. So give that a shot. It's something fun that you can do from town. Uh, these stars are easily naked eye visible from uh, light polluted locations as well as a dark sky location uh, like Grand Canyon. But we'll be working in this region tonight as well. So uh, we'll point out some objects in there. Now we're going to be bouncing back into our planetarium software throughout the evening as we switch from the telescope to um, our planetarium. That way we can point out the major targets that we're going to be working on this evening. So let's get rid of this and let's switch back out to our telescopes and we're going to get going on that and start viewing some of the wonderful objects in the night sky. And the summertime is actually quite fun. There's a lot of very, very cool things visible in the summer months. It's actually a perfect time to get yourself a telescope um, or pull that telescope out when you have a chance. All right, so this is going to be our telescope control system tonight. Uh, the telescope for all of the astronomers that are watching this is a six inch refractor and the camera on the back of it is a monochrome or black and white camera. Uh, the reason I like to use these cameras is they're very very sensitive and it also gives us the ability to use different filters to isolate different wavelengths of light and that allows us to actually study different forms of light and tell us a little bit of the chemistry of the object and I'm going to show you some of what we're doing with that tonight um, because some of the objects that are on our observing list react really well to to these filters so we're going to flip over to our first target of the night and while the telescope is going over there let me actually show you guys uh, where this is uh, this is known as M57 the ring nebula now the ring nebula as you can see it looks like a little cheerio right there this is located in the constellation of Lyra not far from the bright star Vega so let me flip over back to our telescope real quick and we'll actually get it up on the screen Flip over to our filter and we're going to start our exposure. Now in astrophotography we're taking pictures of very dim faint objects. So if you have your cell phone out and you're taking pictures where it goes click 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 um, those are very short exposures. For astrophotography we actually have to leave the camera open for an extended period of time to collect that light. So the pictures we're doing right now are about 10 seconds long. And you can actually see the ring nebula right in the center there. Um, let me pull up our little square there. There we go. Uh, pull up the square. There we go, right in the center there. That is the ring nebula. And I will see about making this a little bit bigger. Uh, let's zoom in on it a little bit. There we go. Perfect. So the ring nebula is in the constellation of Lyra the Harp. It's 2200 light years away and it's about 1.3 light years in diameter. Now if you're new to astronomy, a light year might be an interesting term that you might have heard, um, especially with a lot of the space movies that have been out. But a light year is kind of the measuring stick of astronomy. Now we can't use miles when we're talking astronomy. It's just, it's too big. So think of this as the yardstick. Uh, one light year is six trillion miles. So to give you an example, this is just a little over six trillion miles in diameter. It's a big cloud. Now that is the distance that light travels in one year, about six trillion miles. That equates to about 186,000 miles per second. So throughout the uh, cast here, 
we're going to be talking in light years for the most part. So this object, the Ring Nebula, is 2200 light years away from the Earth. So the light that we're seeing from this object right now left 2200 years ago. It's just now getting to us here. Now, this was discovered by a gentleman, a French astronomer by the name of Charles Messier, in January of 1779. Uh, Messier was actually a comet hunter, and as he perused the night sky looking for comets, he ran across a lot of other celestial objects and documented and cataloged those, and that is known as the Messier Catalog. Um, if you're looking through astronomy books, or um, you know charts for astronomy targets or you're just getting into astronomy one of the most basic catalogs for astronomical targets is the Messier catalog or the M catalog so when you're looking for objects you're actually gonna see it as M57 and then it gets its name the ring nebula for obvious reasons so the Ring Nebula is a planetary nebula, and a planetary nebula is a star that has died and shed it off its outer layers. And let me uh, just make myself a little bigger here real quick just so we can explain this. And we're going to turn off the square here. There we go. So imagine our sun. It's an average star, and unfortunately actually more lucky for us when you have a star like our sun it's not big enough to actually supernova or detonate there's just not enough mass in the star so as our star ages it starts shedding off its outer layers and getting bigger and bigger and bigger and eventually that outer atmosphere sheds off out into space leaving this bubble of dust and gas floating out in space and at the center of that right in the middle is the leftover core of that star and that is a white dwarf and now this is exactly what we're seeing here in the ring nebula um, centered right here you can see the star right in the center if you look close that is the white dwarf or the leftover core of the original star and then this is the outer atmosphere that has shedded itself off out into space and will continue expanding. And this is composed of hydrogen and other uh, chemical elements um, floating out in space. But this is known as a planetary nebula. And the reason why it gets its name is fairly obvious is because planetary nebulas give this spherical look which looks a lot like a planet. So ultimately um, this is why they're called planetary nebulas and we're going to be taking a look at a lot of different planetary nebulas um, this evening as we move from target to target so uh, this is the ring nebula M57 and the constellation of Lyra the harp at about 2200 light years away from the earth we're going to stop our exposure here and we're gonna get ready to flip over to another target. Uh, we're gonna turn off our little pointer square here and get ready to uh, switch over to our next target. Now our next target is a star cluster. And let me pull this up real quick. We're gonna fling the telescope over there. And while it's going to find that, we're gonna bring that up here so we can actually get an idea of uh, where this is in the night sky so we just went from up here right up in here is where m57 was and now we're in the middle of the constellation known as Ophiuchus and uh, we're looking at a star cluster in Ophiuchus right now and let's get the telescope up here so we can actually see it and pull the camera up and get our exposures going really quickly so this this target here um, is what's called a globular cluster a globular cluster is a dense ball of stars 
And there are two types of clusters in the nighttime sky. There are open clusters, kind of expanses of stars. And then there are globular clusters, which are dense balls of stars. And they generally have several hundred thousand stars. And this particular one that you see right in the center, which looks like a stack of sugar on black tablecloth, this is known as M10, uh, referring back to Charles Messier, who we talked about on uh, the Ring Nebula a minute ago. This is um, where the Ring Nebula was M57. This is M10. So this is the 10th entry in Charles Messier's catalog, originally discovered in 1767. So this particular object sits about 14,000 light years away from the Earth and is about 84 light years edge to edge. Um, so going the speed of light, this would take 84 years to cross the cluster and that's going at 186,000 miles per second or six trillion miles a year. It would still take you 86 years to cross the 80, 84, 86 years to cross that cluster. Um, the interesting thing about globular clusters is there's about 200 of them in our galaxy. And there are some galaxies that have even more. Um, but these form a halo around the core of the Milky Way. There's about 200 of them in our galaxy. This particular one uh, completes its orbit around the Milky Way core about 140 million years. That is the orbital period for this cluster. Um, this one obviously contains probably about 300,000 stars, so it's not the largest of the globulars, but it's it's got a very nice dense core and then kind of spreads out. So it's it's a beautiful cluster. This can actually easily be seen in a telescope around six inches in aperture. Um, referring back to the Ring Nebula for a minute, if you're going to go out and view that, you can easily see that in telescopes from about four to six inches in diameter. So these are all relatively easy targets for you to see, um, even at home. So you can give this a shot. And so this is M10 and the constellation of Ophiuchus, and this is a globular cluster, uh, a fun target to go check out. And because these objects are mostly seen around the core of the galaxy, for the most point, they're visible in the summer months when we're actually looking out at the core of the galaxy. So um, we'll be taking a look at a couple others this evening uh, for the globular clusters. Uh, so to wrap that up again, this is M10, 14,000 light years away, 84,000 light years in diameter in the constellation of Ophiuchus. So we're going to stop our exposures here and we're actually going to flip the telescope right next door. There is um, another cluster that is not very far, just a hop, skip and a jump as far as we can see. And um, it is another globular cluster, um, but this one is known as M12. And it's, it's only a couple degrees from M10. So it's still in the constellation of Ophiuchus. In binoculars, you could probably see both of them fairly easily. Uh, this one sits a little bit further at uh, 15,000 light years away, and it's a little bit more condensed. Um, this one's actually really pretty because it's got a collection of brighter stars in the foreground, so it gives it some depth. Um, but this is 15,700 light years away from the Earth and 74 light years edge to edge. Um, also in the constellation of Ophiuchus, uh, this was discovered by Charles Messier in 1764. Now, this one sits really close to the core of the Milky Way. And because of that, it's actually been stripped of millions of stars. And this is due to gravitational influences by our galaxy. So it, it could have been much larger in the past, but over time it's been pulled um, away by the gravity of our own galaxy working kind of against it. Um, this one's probably got about 300,000 stars as well. 
um, but this is M12 in the constellation of Ophiuchus, another globular cluster, um, easily seen in telescopes of around, you know, four to six inches in aperture. If you have a chance to get something a little bit bigger on it, uh, you can resolve the finer stars in the cluster itself and pop out more detail in there with the, the larger star uh, telescopes. So this is a fun one to give a shot as well if you are in town. And it's a beautiful target in dark skies as well. And this, once again, is M12 in the constellation of Ophiuchus. <clears throat> and now we're going to flip over um, to our next target. So we're going to go ahead and stop the exposures there and get ready for our next target. So let's get the telescope uh, over there. It's going to go find it. While we're doing that, let me pull up this target in our constellations. So now we're heading over um, back over into the arms of the Milky Way right here. Um, into the constellation of Volpeca right here. And right here is a little faint fuzzy, another planetary nebula. This is called the Dumbbell Nebula, or I think it looks more like an apple core. Um, but this is a planetary nebula, just like the Ring Nebula, except this particular one. When we're looking at the Ring Nebula, imagine that you're looking at it like a donut face on to where you can see through the donut hole. This one we're actually looking on edge. So we don't get to see through the center. We're looking on the edge of it. So slightly different perspective here. So let me uh, get this out of the way here and get back into our telescope and flip on the exposures and let's take a look at this thing. So M27 or the Dumbbell Nebula is relatively close. It's about 1200 light years away from the Earth and about three light years in diameter. So it's it's got some good size to it. It was uh, originally discovered in 1764 by Charles Messier. And there we go right there. Um, and again, it is a planetary nebula. So again, we start out with a star like our sun and over time it sheds off its outer layers into space and we're actually able to um, see that cloud expand outward. And this is exactly what we're seeing here. Now you can actually see the center star right in the center. Uh, that is the white dwarf or the core of the original star that shed it off its outer layers into space. That is the leftovers of that star. And the cloud is what remains of the atmosphere of that star. So uh, very, very cool object. This one's very easy to do even in town. Um, you can see this in like a three inch telescope, but if you've got a larger telescope, like a six or 10 inch telescope, you can resolve more detail. And um, obviously if you get to dark skies and larger telescopes, it just aids more and more and more. Now, I wanted to take a minute here because this particular nebula is actually really, really interesting to um, do what we call narrowband imaging. And narrowband imaging is when we use specialized filters, uh, much like this. Um, these are a set of filters I've got right here. Um, we have something very similar. This is a filter wheel. So the filters live in there and then they move into the optical path when we're taking pictures. So we have something very similar like this out on the telescope. Uh, this holds five. The one we have out there has seven for a variety of different filters. Now, we use a couple different filters to study different objects. Uh, the first one is known as hydrogen alpha, which is actually way in the red part of the visible spectrum. So it's actually red light. But the reason why we use this is because we can learn a lot about nebulas by isolating different wavelengths of light. We're basically doing chemistry. So this is visual light that we see here. You're gonna watch really quickly as the image downloads here that it's gonna to flip to the hydrogen alpha filter and you're gonna notice the structure change. There we go. 
So in here, you can see a lot of the, the structure of the nebula can actually be seen with this filter. And we're able to isolate some of this inner structure portion. And what's happening is this filter is isolating one particular wave of light or wavelength of light and that's hydrogen alpha so this would be red light very very specific red light that's getting rid of everything else now nebulas like the dumbbell that we see here emit light in that particular frequency and because of that we can actually sit here and photograph these objects in different filters and learn about their structures and their uh, components and what they're possibly made of by isolating different wavelengths of light where you're actually doing chemistry with light. So an H-alpha filter like we're using now is just one of various filters called narrow band filters that allow us to study different wavelengths of light. So let's stop that real quick. And now we're going to flip over to oxygen three. An oxygen three filter allows us to view double ionized oxygen in celestial objects. Some objects have more than others, but planetary nebulas like the dumbbell in particular have a lot of it. So I'm going to start the picture here real quick. And what you're gonna see is the structure detail that you see in the nebula is going to change when the image comes up. You'll notice a lot different structures start to appear when the oxygen image pops up because we're looking at a different frequency of light. So as you can see right there, the structures that we're able to observe by isolating that particular wavelength of light is very different so we can kind of understand more about an object by studying it in different wavelengths of light and this is why we use uh, narrowband filters to help us understand um, and study this this is the same filter set that's actually on the hubble space telescope and um, we use very similar filters to what they use to get images that are similar and what details can be pulled out. So as you can see right here, there's a lot of double ionized oxygen present in this nebula. So um, this can give us an idea on the evolution of stars and how something like our sun might end its life and it just gives us kind of a snapshot into the future on how certain stars will come to the end of their life. So as we can see here, um, this is the Dumbbell Nebula and the constellation of Volpeca. And right now we are running a Oxygen 3 filter, um, observing double ionized oxygen in this nebula. So. Let me stop there and we're gonna flip to the last filter. This is a sulfur filter. Now there's not a lot of sulfur up in the night sky in comparison to hydrogen, which is the most abundant element in the universe, and oxygen. Um, sulfur does give us um, a little different view on some things, which you'll see right here in just a second as it shifts one more time. And you'll notice the detail as you can see there, the details are very different. Uh, once again, sulfur is way over in the red part of the spectrum, not quite to infrared, but not far. Um, it's still visible to the, um, the eye, but it is, it's getting over to the limitations way over in the red part of the spectrum. So you can see some of that center structure there is still visible, but not quite as much and this shows us that there's not a lot of sulfur present in there and a lot of this data is more helpful if you're running like the hubble space telescope but you can still produce uh, beautiful images called false color images where we use color mapping and what that means is we would assign a color to the h alpha filter the oxygen filter 
in the sulfur filter where you make a final color image from these three filters and the different colors will actually map out the different elements that are present in that nebula so we can kind of color code if you will what's what and you can assign that to whatever so uh, again this is the dumbbell nebula in sulfur and you can see there's very very little sulfur present but um, other objects do have more uh, visible sulfur in them depending on what's going on inside the nebula so we're going to hit stop here and we're going to get ready to go over to our next target now we actually have already talked about our next target it's right here this is alberio which is the beak of the swan and alberio is a binary star and what that means is there's two stars and normally they're orbiting each other now Alberio has not been completely identified if it's a uh, a true binary system or it's they're orbiting one another or just an optical binary where one's here one's here and it just looks from our perspective that they're together um, doing some reach research on this it does appear that Alberio is more of a um, optical binary so not a true gravitationally bound binary um, but it's um, they're still actually doing some studies on that so let me flip us over to Alberio and we're not too far from it now Alberio is a very very pretty um, star system to see in a telescope because the stars actually have color one is blue one's gold now unfortunately tonight because we're using a black and white camera we're not able to see the colors so what we're going to do here is play with some of the filters the filter that i have in here right now is a red filter so it's going to pass more of the red light and none of the blue light so we'll actually see if we can pop the, the two out differently uh, so Alberio uh, coming up right here um, actually you can see both of them and like I said we're looking in the arms of the Milky Way so you just see every point of light in here is a star thousands and thousands of stars are in here um, so this is Alberio and you can see there are two stars Alberio is the very tip of Cygnus the Swan at 430 light years and like I said, we don't know if it's a true binary or just a optical binary where just from perspective, they look different. Now, there is um, data stating that these are a visual binary or optical binary where one is 400 light years away and the other one's 430 light years away. So let's see if we can play with this. Um, if you have a chance to look at this in a telescope, you can do it from some of the worst locations. You don't need a dark sky to see these. They're stars, they're relatively bright, they're actually naked eye visible. It looks like one star to the naked eye, but under a telescope it splits them um, into individual stars. So let's switch over to the blue filter um, one of these stars is like an amber color, like an orangish color, and the other one's kind of like a, a baby blue. And if we play with the color filters, we should be able to actually see the, the change in light from these, figuring out which one's which, because the filters are blocking out certain wavelengths. And that really didn't help too much. Um, like I said, they are bright, but... Um, if you have a chance to get your telescope out or go to a star party and see Alberio, you will notice that they actually do have some color to them. It's actually pretty neat to be able to see one's gold or amber and the other one's kind of blue. Um, so this is Alberio, which is the beak of the swan, which you can see right here. 
So to our naked eye, it's going to look like one. But as you start to zoom in, it actually starts to split into two stars. So something to kind of take a look at. It's pretty neat. And it's a fun one to share with um, friends and family because it does have that color variation uh, between the two stars. So this is Albireo, the constellation of Cygnus, about 430 light years away. And it is a binary star system or a optical binary. So they look like they're close to each other, um, but in reality they're not. We don't know yet. There's still studies trying to confirm uh, either one. So we're going to stop this real quick and we're going to flip over to our next line of targets and we're going to start descending into the southern part of the sky into that Scorpio Sagittarius Ophiuchus location. All right, so let's get this started. Um, our next target is a famous nebula. Um, many people actually know or have seen this nebula before, but you may not know it. Um, so let's find it. Uh, this is M16, the Eagle Nebula, which is in the constellation of Serpens, um, right on the edge up here, but um, it actually sits just off the core of the Milky Way. So we're going to take a look at that real quick. I'm going to grab a drink real quick. So I can keep talking. All right, so we're over here in the southeast portion of the sky. Our telescope is on target. And we are going to, this is actually a very, very cool um, object to see. So we're going to start with the visual filter, just so you can see kind of what the human eye would actually register in this star field. And then we're going to flip over to one of those uh, narrow band filters that we talked about just earlier, where it isolates the particular wavelength of light. So this is the star field that we're looking in. Um, and then the nebula that we're looking is right here. This is M16, the Eagle Nebula which is about 6,000 light years away and about 58 light years in diameter. Um, it was discovered by French astronomers in 1745, so we've known about it for quite a while. Uh, this is a star-forming region, so what's actually occurring is that gas, that hydrogen gas and other elements is condensing down, uh, making new stars. Now, because we're looking in the... Basically, we're in the green part of the spectrum. This is a green filter. It's only letting green light through. Um, if this was a color camera, everything would be green. Um, be, but this is really what the human eye would pick up in a telescope. You'd see a little bit of nebulosity in there. You can maybe pull out the structure of the, uh, the eagle structure in the center there. But we're not getting all of it um, because we need to pop that out. So let me show you just what happens when you use the right filter. This region is composed of mostly hydrogen. So what are we going to use? We're going to use our hydrogen alpha filter. And what that's going to do is it's going to knock out all the residual light pollution and light glow that we get and only pass the light being emitted from the nebula and stars in that particular frequency of light. So the telescope has moved that filter into position. The camera's going to start a picture. And what you're going to see here is a dramatic change in what you can see by just knowing what wavelengths of light to isolate. So we're going to go from visual to that narrow, narrow view. And it's going to pop that nebula out easy. So um, as you can see, we've completely switched the filter. And all the structure that's inside the nebula there has become easily seen. Um, this is again the hydrogen alpha filter. And what's, what it's doing is it's knocking out all the light that does not meet this filter's uh, credentials. And it's only allowing light 
that the filter is designed to let pass through. Now, because we've studied the night sky, we understand how these nebulas work and how they uh, emit light. We know that this emits light in the red part of the spectrum where hydrogen alpha exists. This whole nebula is being lit up by the stars inside of it. So think of it kind of like a neon sign where it's being amplified and excited by uh, the stars there. And we can actually stretch this a little bit just so you can see how much nebulosity there is in here. It all extends way out here. Um, this nebula is about 58 light years uh, in diameter and it's really really famous from the Hubble Space Telescope. The image is known as the Pillars of Creation is what you've probably heard it as. And right here in the center, um, pull up my little square here, right there in the center as you can see in, in here, those are the Pillars of Creation that were captured by the Hubble Space Telescope. Now, we're using a 6-inch telescope, an amateur 6-inch telescope, and the Hubble Space Telescope is several meters across, um, over 3 feet in diameter, and it can easily see more detail than this because it's also out of the atmosphere. Now, this is 6,000 light years away. This dust is condensing down, making new stars. And just to give you scale, um, right in here, these pillars are about five light years in diameter this way and almost eight light years tall. So this is a very, very large structure. And again, that nebula, that whole nebula that we see is about 58, almost 60 light years in diameter. And this is M16, uh, the Eagle Nebula and the constellation of serpents. And what we're doing right now is actually observing it in hydrogen alpha light. So we're watching the glowing hydrogen um, in that nebula. Now we can actually flip through the filters and see how the nebula looks um, in these different wavelengths like we did earlier. So what I've just done now is we flipped from the hydrogen alpha filter to the oxygen filter. And what you're going to see here in a second is the detail is going to dramatically shift again as we go from hydrogen to double ionized oxygen. So as you can see here, there's a lot less oxygen visible in the nebula. You can still see it, um, but there's a lot less oxygen in, in the nebula there. And this, by using these filters, we can study and understand the formation of these nebulas a lot more because we're able to isolate the light and understand how they form and how stars can form inside the nebula. So this is the Oxygen 3 filter. Excuse me. So this is M16, the Eagle Nebula. Um, you can see the, the kind of cluster of stars in, in this nebula through telescopes around six inch to eight inch. But if, if you wanna get the nebula detail, you're gonna need some kind of nebula filter. And there's a variety of them out there that can help with that. But dark skies and telescopes of around eight inch or bigger, um, if you can get up to like a 12 inch or bigger, that'll really assist quite a bit. But, um, being able to see the pillars and a lot of the structure in there is gonna take just aperture. A large telescope is what you're gonna to need to make that observation possible. So you can give this a try, but this would be best suited in a dark sky location, much like you would get at Grand Canyon. And we do hope that next year, 2021, that you'll be able to join us up there to actually see this for yourself. But again, this is the um, M16 Eagle Nebula, about 6,000 light years away from the Earth. All right, so we're, we're cooking through our uh, object list tonight, and now we're actually gonna switch targets um, once again. 
and we're gonna move from some nebulas back to a star cluster. And uh, so let's take a look of where we're gonna move to now. Let me type in our object and let's see. We're looking right here. We're not too far from the Eagle Nebula actually um, on the opposite side of the constellation um, in Scutum is where we're actually looking. And this is known as the Wild Duck Cluster. This one's actually very, very pretty in binoculars um, if you have a chance. But let's see how the telescope uh, pulls it down. So we're gonna flip our camera here and turn that back on and take some images of M11, the Wild Duck Cluster is the name of this object. Now this is very, very pretty in uh, pair of binoculars. A decent sized telescope around three inch or four inch in aperture is very, very good for this. But uh, we'll see it here in a minute. And there we go, right there. Um, this is very close to the core of the Milky Way. We're looking in one of the arms. So there's a ton of stars in this region. Um, so this is actually a very dense open cluster. So this is not a globular cluster like we did earlier with M10 and M12. Uh, this is a open cluster. This was originally founded by Gottfried Kirch in 1681. Um, but, uh, Charles Messier did document this in 1764 as his 11th entry. And uh, this, they feel had this V of stars um, that you can see up here. And this is where it got the name Wild Duck Cluster because it looks like a flying flock of ducks. Um, so you can use your imagination. Got a satellite right through there. That's what that line is right there. Um, this is 6,200 light years away from the earth and 190 light years in diameter. And is very, very close to the core of the galaxy. It's only 22,000 light years away from the center of the galaxy. So it's, it's very close to the center of the Milky Way. And again, this is M11, the wild duck cluster. Um, beautiful um, collection of stars. Um, really, really nice to see in small telescopes. If you've got like a three or four inch and you're just perusing the Milky Way, this is a fun one to run into out there because it just sits in a sea of stars. So uh, a very neat one to actually check out. Um, a good pair of binoculars about, you know, 50 millimeter in diameter would also be a very good option for viewing this cluster of stars. So uh, once again, this is M11, the wild duck cluster um, in the constellation of Scutum. And you do not need a dark sky location to see this, um, but if you wanna get this crazy star field and lots of detail in there, um, having darker skies for visual observation can help or the cameras can easily bring that out. Okay, so uh, again, just wrapping this up, this is M11 or Messier 11, a wild duck cluster, 6,200 light years away from the Earth, and 190 light years in diameter. So it's a pretty large cluster. So let's stop that, and we're gonna get ready to move to our next target. And we're going back to some nebulas. Now, this next nebula, as the telescope moves over there, is actually the next door neighbor of the Eagle Nebula that we looked at just earlier. And this is called the Swan Nebula or the Omega Nebula, um, also known as M, as in Messier 17. So it's right here in the constellation of, uh, so this is actually technically in Sagittarius. Um, but as you can see, here's the um, Swan Nebula, and here is M16, the Eagle Nebula, <coughs> excuse me, uh, just above that. You can see they're very close to each other.
So um, let's. This is a very fun one to do in amateur telescopes. It's very easy to see, and it actually looks a lot like what it says it is. It looks like a swan. So let's uh, get the images going here. Get the camera pulling some stuff down. So the Swan Nebula is a another star forming region, much like the Pillars of Creation or the Eagle Nebula M16. Um, this is 6,000 light years away from the Earth and about 15 light years wide. So there it is. There's the Swan, and it does look like a Swan, doesn't it? You have the the head of the Swan, and then the body. It almost looks like a Swan floating on a lake. So it's actually pretty neat to, to see something like that. So that is the Swan Nebula. And it looks very similar to this in a telescope using like a nebula filter. And you can easily see this in very small telescopes, three inch. Um, a good pair of binoculars from a dark location can see this. But as you get larger and larger telescopes, the more detail starts to pop out. What I really enjoy about this one is because it's a star forming region, there's a ton of hydrogen gas in here. So we're going to flip our hydrogen alpha filter back into the mix here and go from visual light, like what we're seeing here, to that narrow band light. And this object just explodes in detail when using a hydrogen alpha filter. So um, you'll see here just a second as we flip from visual to the narrow band hydrogen. Um, just how much so see all that in there all that dust is hanging out all that dust and gas is hanging out in that star field and all that structure as well um, we're a little bit of out, out of focus on this particular filter um, but we're we're close enough to get the gist of it um, from there but you can just see all the structure um, let's see if we can stretch some of this out so there's some down here and all kinds of stuff floating around up there. Um, very, very different when you open up this um, with different types of filters. And much of this was invisible a minute ago to us because we weren't able to see it. Um, but this filter allows us to isolate a lot of that detail for us to see. So this is the Swan Nebula or the Omega Nebula about 6,000 light years away in the constellation of Sagittarius, about 15 light years wide. And this is a star forming region. So again, it's hydrogen and dust condensing down to make new stars. Um, this is a, one of my favorites to see in the nighttime sky. Again, you can do this in like a, a small telescope, um, the aid of like a nebula filter, something like an ultra high contrast filter, which is known as a UHC. Um, if you can add something to that to your telescope, makes it really easy to pop this out visually. But the aid of dark skies, uh, much like we have up here at Grand Canyon National Park, really helps with this. So if you ever have the chance to come out to the star party in the future, this is one that you'd actually be able to see, and it's just amazing what you can get uh, visually um, in something like this but the cameras do a very nice job in pulling out all this faint nebulosity and the more it sits on there you can see all this dust that just sits up there so um, again this is m17 and the constellation of sagittarius also known as the swan nebula so very very cool and then we are looking in hydrogen alpha at this time. So we are isolating the glowing hydrogen light that's being emitted from this nebula and observing that and cutting out all the other light. That's why we're able to actually see all of this amazing detail and structure inside of this nebula. All right, so we're gonna flip gears once again um, and move to our next target. Um, this one is also in Sagittarius and we are now um, flipping back to a globular cluster like M10 and M12 from earlier except this one is much larger. So let's uh, send our telescope over there real quick. 
not too far from it, just a little jog. There we go. We're going to get the camera back in and ready to go. Get the right filter and hit expose. So again, we're in the constellation of Sagittarius once again for this target. Uh, this is known as M22 or Messier 22. It is 10,000 light years away from the Earth, which is um, actually really, really close. And um, this has a ton of stars inside of it. So uh, this is another globular cluster um, visible in the constellation of Sagittarius. And this is a beautiful cluster. It's a very large cluster, about 500,000 stars. And this is um, deep within Sagittarius. And this was discovered in 1665 by German astronomers, but it wasn't cataloged by Charles Messier for his 22nd entry to be M22 until 1764. Uh, this is one of the closest globular clusters from us at only 10,000 light years away. So that's relatively close, but it is moving away from us at about 93 miles per second. So um, over time, long time, uh, this will progressively get farther and further away from us. But for right now, on average, it's about 10,000 light years. Um, what's very cool about this particular uh, neb or cluster is it actually is one of the few globular clusters that contains a planetary nebula or a, one of those little uh, dying stars that shed it off its outer layers like we talked about with the ring nebula and the dumbbell nebula. This right here is um, uh, about 500,000 stars, but in there somewhere is a tiny planetary nebula. So a very, very cool um, object for us to check out um, when we have the chance. This is great in binoculars if you if you have a chance to go out and explore. Um, let me get the telescope. Just we're going to get ready for our next target real quick. Um, but let me just grab a photo here real quick of um, M22 so we can continue to talk about that real quick. And then we'll let the, the telescope get ready for our next set of targets. <clears throat> so let's pull down that image real quick. That is going to be, there we go. There's M22. And then on the back end here, we're going to get our telescope uh, switched over to get real nice and sharp. Um, uh, for this uh, next set of objects that we're going to be uh, looking at because we're going to have to look at much of the same uh, regions at this point. All right. So when we're doing astrophotography, this is a time-consuming thing, um, but we want to make sure everything is the best we can get it. Um, so... There we go. So what we're gonna do right here is actually, uh, there, we're all set. Okay, um, so we're back on M22. So we're gonna actually flip over to probably my favorite target in the nighttime sky um, and see what we can get out of it. Um, so while it's slewing over there, um, let me show you where this is at. So we're currently in Sagittarius right down here, but we're going to make our way up into Cygnus, into um, this section right here, and this is known as the Veil Nebula. And the Veil Nebula is this massive uh, nebula complex and is broken up into several sections. So we're going to have to spend a little bit of time uh, going through this particular set of objects. And we're going to have to do this with the hydrogen filter because of how faint um, this detail is. So we're going to let the, the camera do its thing. We've actually upped the exposures from the 15 seconds we've been doing to 30 seconds. 
and that is still relatively short when you're taking pictures in astrophotography no most images are minutes long um, this particular setup that we're running tonight i generally shoot about five minute exposures and then stack all those to make the final image so this right here is uh, very very short so let's see if this gets it real quick so uh, this is the veil nebula it's this faint almost razor blade kind of scythe blade um, looking structure right here in the middle um, this is part of the veil nebula complex and we can actually see right here we're on this section um, this section right here is what we're looking at now the veil nebula is a supernova remnant so um, about 15,000 years ago a massive star um, much larger than our Sun 20 times the mass of our Sun died now unlike a planetary nebula and remember our planetary nebula where it just kind of puffs off its outer outer shell into space and that's it um, this particular star was so big and so massive that eventually the outward force from that star lost against gravity that can dense down really quickly sending a shock wave back out and detonating the star violently um, and this is known as a supernova and what happens is it sheds that material very quickly out into space so this is one half of what you can think of like a pair of parentheses floating out in space this is one half of that parenthesis um, this is called the Western Veil or NGC 6960. Uh, this whole structure is about 2,000 light years away, and about 100 light years in diameter, so it's huge. This actually, if you were looking up into the night sky, this spans 36 times the area of the moon, the full moon. This is 36 times bigger um, for the amount of space that it takes up in the night sky. Um, this particular nebula really needs dark skies to see it um, with the aid of like a nebula filter and a telescope of around six inch or bigger um, if you can get a 10 or 12 inch telescope this object is beautiful and a dark sky sight but you really need to get away from city lights because it's it is rather faint um, but what's very cool about this whole nebula structure is the delicate details and how intricate the nebula actually is. So um, if you're looking for a challenge or um, you're going out to dark skies for the first time this summer, this would be the uh, nebula to try and check out. It's relatively easy to find as well. But um, definitely give the Veil Nebula a try because there is so much cool stuff um, in this one. And it's absolutely one of my favorites to show at Grand Canyon. Um, so hopefully in the coming years, if you have a chance to uh, join us up there or get out to another star party um, in the summertime, ask to see the Veil Nebula and especially if you have a large large telescope ask to see the veil nebula because it is absolutely stunning um so while we're here i'm going to actually flip to the other side of the uh the veil nebula basically the other end of the parenthesis is what we're going to be um taking a look at and this is called the eastern veil nebula so let me get the telescope to kind of wander its way over there. Uh, let's see. Okay. About there. These nebulas are actually made up of several different documented nebulas. So 
trying to get all of this in one view requires a very, very large field of view. Um, and the telescope that we're running tonight can only do this in sections. So um, that's why we're having to kind of break this apart into uh, bits um, to capture this whole nebula. So the one we actually just saw, that was the Western Veil. And now we are on the opposite side, um, which is the Eastern Veil Nebula. Um, this actually is a little bit brighter, so it's slightly easier to see if you want to make a um, attempt to visually see it. And it has a lot of very awesome structure um, inside of it as well. So let's get the image to come up. <clears throat> There we go, there it is right there. So this is the uh, Eastern Veil Nebula. Um, again, this is a brighter section of the Veil Nebula, so it can it's a slightly easier catch um, than the Western is. But if you can get the Western, you can definitely get the Eastern. Um, again, also needs dark skies. Probably at least a six inch telescope to get the real nice detail. But if you ever have a chance to, you know, get to the eyepiece of like 16 inch or bigger um, in a dark sky viewing this nebula, it is um, amazing. Just the intricate detail that you can actually see in this nebula structure. Um, again, we do have the hydrogen filter in place, so it is highlighting all the hydrogen gas that is being emitted um, and excited by the stars, um, so we can easily see that even here in town. But the cameras, we always have to remember, the camera is way more sensitive than the human eye will ever be. So um, this is the Eastern Veil Nebula and the constellation of Cygnus the Swan. This is a supernova remnant, so a star about 20 times larger than our sun died and violently exploded the material out into space, forming a, basically a pair of parentheses. This is one of the pair of parentheses, and then the other one, which we did earlier, was the Western Veil, um, and those two, plus um, some intricate details in between the two, make up what we call the Veil Nebula. And that is my personal favorite object in the nighttime sky. I love all the, the delicate or, um, delicate uh, filaments that kind of weave their way through this nebula. All right, um, we're going to flip to our next object here. And again, we're not too far away from it. And this one is actually cannot even fit in the field of view of the telescope that we're looking in. Um, but we're gonna kind of center on a particular spot and see if we can um, get some structure to come out. So this is the North American Nebula and we are in Cygnus as well. Um, we were in the Veil vale Nebula down here and now we're making our way up to the North American Nebula, which is uh, just off the bright star of Deneb at the end of Cygnus the Swan. This is another huge nebula structure, so we're not able to actually get all of it in there. But what you may notice is that it gets its name the North American Nebula because it looks like the continent of North America. You have the Pacific Coast over here. Here's Mexico. Here's the Gulf what would be Florida, and then of course the East Coast um, over here. So it does kind of resemble the North American continent. Um, this is also a large structure of uh, nebula, and we'll see what we can bring out on this. This really, really requires a very large field of view. So if you're gonna be viewing this um, object, you really, this one really does need dark skies, uh, the aid of, a filter, maybe something like an oxygen three filter, um, and like a four inch refractor. Really, really wide field of view is really what you want to see. Um, if you can get that, you can do it front with binoculars in very dark skies. You can still get some of the detail in there. So 
this is uh, where we're looking right here. We're basically in the North American uh, nebula, kind of down where the Gulf. This would be essentially be where Mexico is um, because this is called the, the Great Wall, um, which is a big structure inside of the North American nebula. Now, the North American nebula is 1,600 light years from Earth and 100 light years in diameter. It was discovered by William Herschel in 1786. Um, this is basically an interstellar cloud of ionized hydrogen gas. Um, and this whole region actually is filled with hydrogen gas. Um, and it does resemble the North American continent. This is called the Great Wall, which is a huge structure inside of the north american nebula itself um, the gulf would be down here is what we're looking at and if we had a wider field of view we'd be able to get more of this structure um, we can i have actually a small telescope on top right now and um, let's see what we can get out of it um, i'm not sure this one will be able to get um, it has the field of view to get all of it. We're going to see what we can get out of it. Um, this particular camera that's running over here just doesn't have the sensitivity, but we're going to see what we can get out of this um, if possible. Now this particular telescope that we're shooting on, which is riding on top of the main telescope we've been using. This is only about two inches in diameter. It's a, a very small uh, little telescope and um, it actually has a color camera mounted to it. Uh, this is one of the only color cameras that I actually have, but um, we're going to see if we can actually pull the North American. I can actually see it right here. Um, let's see if we can pull it out a bit. There it is. It's um, you can start to see it right here. You can see the um, Mexico region. Um, this is the uh, Pacific coast right here. This is the Gulf, and then kind of that Florida East Coast area right there. But this is the North American Nebula um, in the constellation of Cygnus the Swan. This is a massive. Um, hydrogen cloud of ionized hydrogen gas. Um, and then that particular wall that we were talking about down here in the, what would be the Mexico region of the nebula is about 20 light years long. So it's huge. Um, but this is a great binocular challenge object um, from dark skies. Uh, if you have the chance, I would uh, definitely recommend uh, giving it a go, but you can actually see the North American uh, coming out there, um, right there. So it's it's uh, pretty neat to see it and um, <clears throat> to give it a shot right there. So again, that is the North American Nebula um, in the constellation of Cygnus NGC 7000 and great binocular or wide field object uh, target for us to actually take a look at. So. Um, we're going to give this a uh, close and um, let's actually flip over to our next target. We're doing a lot of stuff in the Cygnus region because there's so much stuff to actually see. And let's slew over to our next target real quick. Not too far away, um, just to show you where we're at. So we were right here in uh, Cygnus the Swan just below Deneb, and we moved right here over to the Crescent Nebula. So very, very close. Um, pretty much the entire constellation of Cygnus is practically a nebula. It's all shrouded in hydrogen. So it's a very uh, heavily nebula area of the night sky. So uh, we are now on another very, very cool object. And we're back on the main telescope now. And this is the Crescent Nebula, um, NGC 6888. 
Uh, this is 5,000 light years away from the Earth and about 32 light years in diameter. And this was discovered by William Herschel in 1792. Now, the crescent is a really unique emission nebula because it's not formed from how other nebulas are generally done. This is a... Uh, here it is right here. That's the Crescent Nebula. Um, this is formed from what's known as a wolf Riot star. And these are massive stars um, that are getting towards the end of their life. They're shedding off a bunch of uh, shock waves and stellar wind out into space. And what happens on this particular one is that two of those stellar wind shock waves actually collide with each other, um, making this really unique uh, nebula it looks like a brain almost um, and these are actually forming just shells um, there we go and there's actually a bunch of hydrogen gas like I said earlier with Cygnus a bunch of hydrogen gas in this region so uh, this is NGC 6888 this is actually quite a challenge um, in dark skies um, you really need a telescope of around 10 inch or larger preferably 12 inch or larger um, but bigger telescopes with the aid of a nebula filter, this is a very good object to go after um, if you're looking for some kind of a challenge target. Um, but this is the Crescent Nebula, NGC 6888 in the constellation of Cygnus the Swan. Uh, I'm sorry, yes, Cygnus the Swan. And this is formed by what's called a wolf Riot star. Um, and there's numerous types of these nebulas up in the nighttime sky, so go ahead and uh, check that out. Um, but this is a crazy region to take a look at or photograph because of just how much detail is going on around this uh, particular nebula. So we are getting a little crunched for time. Um, so we're gonna flip over to our final target of the night and um, this is kind of a two for one uh, nebula and cluster. So let me get this plugged in here. So while we're doing that, I want to show you where this is at. NGC 6520 is what we're going to search for. And this, as you can see, is right in the heart of the Milky Way core in the constellation of Sagittarius. Tons of stars are going to be in this region. Um, so this is NGC 6520 in the constellation of Sagittarius. Now let's flip this over, get the camera rolling on this. Um, let's switch over to, now this one we're going to be using our visual filter, back to that green filter. Um, so we're going to open up that camera and let it expose and get that, that light in there and see what we can get. Um, now, NGC 6520 is actually not the main target for this discussion. Um, it just happens to be right next to the target that we're actually going to be taking a look at. So that's kind of the the plan here. So let's get this picture downloaded real quick. Take a look at it. Boom. Every single dot that you see on the screen right here is a star. We are looking in the heart of the Milky Way galaxy right now. And right here, this little cluster, this is NGC 6520. 5,500 light years away. But that's not what we're looking for. What we're actually looking for is this dark spot right below it. And let me get my handy dandy square. And there you go. Right there in the center of that square, that dark spot, that is actually the reason that we're on this location. And this is what is known as a dark nebula and 
dark nebula are very unique. So unlike other nebulas that we've been seeing tonight, which are known as emission nebulas that emit their own light out into space, dark nebula are very dense clouds of dust that actually obstruct or block uh, starlight from behind them. And they appear as these dark inky splotches. And this is actually known as the ink spot. Um, there is a catalog of these types of nebula known as Barnard Nebula, which were cataloged by E.E. E. Barnard uh, done at Yerkes Observatory in the 1800s on glass plates. This was before, you know, film was being used for astrophotography. Um, this astronomer, E.E. E. Barnard, used glass plates on his telescopes to actually photograph these objects and document them and he made a very famous uh, book called uh, Photo a photographic atlas of selected regions of the milky way and the original books are exceedingly rare and very expensive if you can even find them they're normally locked in vaults in observatories but they have a new kind of remastered print that you can actually get even nowadays and you can see some of uh, all the documented material that was done in there. So dark nebulas are inky spots of dense dust that are obstructing the background uh, stars. So every single dot that you see in this image is a star, but then we have this huge um, little spot right here called the ink spot that's actually blocking that and that is known as a dark nebula. Um, and the catalog for these is Barnard. This is the 86th entry, or B86. And um, this is called the Ink Spot Nebula, not far from its next door neighbor, NGC 6520. Now, astronomers who have been uh, studying this region, let me get rid of our square here so you can get the whole image. Um, who've been studying this region actually think that the this dark nebula might be related to the cluster of this open star cluster right here as possibly the remnants or leftovers of the nebula that actually formed these clusters so that's just a thought on that but uh, this is a dark nebula and dark nebula really require just excellent excellent skies. Um, the Grand Canyon, if you have a chance to join us in the future, dark nebulas are fantastic from the Grand Canyon due to its high altitude um, and high, um, high level of dark skies. It gives you the perfect combination to actually observe these types of objects. And the only reason we're actually able to observe this right now is because of the camera being so much more sensitive this whole, a lot of this region would be just wasted um, from the city light, uh, from the human eye. It just, it would blanket it out and you wouldn't be able to see a whole lot there. All right, well, that actually wraps us up for pretty much our hour and a half time limit that we've got right now. So, I want to thank you all for joining me for the ride across uh, the beautiful summer skies. Um, I would love to see everyone out at a future Grand Canyon star party, but thank you all once again for joining us for the Grand Canyon virtual star party. My name is Kevin Lagore from Focus Astronomy. Thank you all for watching, clear skies, and stay safe.